Hello, Sharon. Good to see you. Okay. Hi. I'm speaking to you from Nam, Melbourne, whose traditional owners are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Finally, out of lockdown, we can enjoy Gunyang, which is the kangaroo apple season. And I pay my respect to their elders, past and present, and to the ancestors of the lands where you come from. And today, now with your permission, we will share our learnings over the course of the next hour. The Reinventing the Wheel series is an initiative of the Knowledge House for Craft, an association of thinkers and makers that aims to reflect the global diversity of our field. Each of these talks becomes a spoke in the wheel, a growing repository of craft knowledge. And I wish to acknowledge my colleagues in this endeavor, uh, Ben Liniel, hello, Ben, and uh, Sharon Zhang, the lister, hello, Sharon. Uh, in this series, we've heard from Arti Kulra on Rabindranath Tagore, Leila Alhamad on the Arab focus on smell, Lagi Mama on the customary Moana perspective, Linda McIntosh on royalty in Laotian craft, Joseph Ndoni on the One Village, One Product movement, Ha Yung Cho on the role of universities in modern Korean craft. Ezra Shales on industrial craft in the US. In a session previously with the Journal of Modern Craft on the mask as a pandemic craft. Patricia Flanagan on the haptic interface. Professor Annie Ng Chen, who's with us today again, thank you, on the development of the Chinese workstation. Sachiko Tamashiga on Japanese mirror craft and Liliana Murray and Silvia Sasaoka on Brazilian Mingue. And I think Liliana is with us as well. Greetings, Liliana. Uh, inspired by the discourse of our Tongan colleagues, we call on the previous speaker to make a salutation before we begin. So Sharon Sang Delisto, who previously presented a very moving paper last time on refugee craft. Uh, I invite you to offer us some, some words before we begin the proper talk. Thank you, Kevin. Um, hi, everyone. I'm speaking from the city of Hong Kong, a place of um, Chinese heritage shaped by centuries of international connections. I want to welcome today's speakers, uh, Forrest and Xu, from two parts of the world um, with a poem by a famous poet, Lei Ba, from the Ting, Ting, Dyna, Ting Dynasty. Um, it speaks of the cherished encounters of those you can share delights and uh, connect beyond borders and differences. It describes a precious herbal um, wine served in a jade bowl reflecting a glorious amber tongue. If you meet a host um, who would share it with you and fellowship with you, it does not matter if you are in your hometown or a foreign land. I'm going to read it in my mother tongue, Cantonese. Ha zhong hang, lei ba. Na ning mei zhou, wat gam hang, yu huan sing lai. Fu pa gong, dan si zhu yin. Today we look at the different um, interpretation, interpretations of crafts, yet celebrate our common love for them. So welcome everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Sharon. And uh, so it's, it's a wonderful concept to drink from this jade cup uh, together. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, with this event, we continue our partnership with the Journal of Modern Craft in sharing important, the important research it contains. Well, the current issue has two papers that reflect the meaning of craft in different cultures. Forrest Pelsu's reflects on the identity of craft in 20th century France and Professor Xu Wu's article, 
features unique perspectives on craft in the Qing Dynasty, China. At play here is the question of whether craft plays a radical or a conservative role in society. The arts and crafts movement position craft in radical opposition to mainstream industrial capitalism, which resonates today with the maker movement. Yet craft can also play a central role in the authority of hegemonic institutions such as the, the monarchy. And these two papers should help clarify this, this seeming contradiction. These projects also contribute to a central concern of the Knowledge House for Craft, which is to develop a dictionary of world craft, to use the rich diversity of meanings attached to craft to better understand its global difference. So let's first begin with uh, Forrest and her article, Tradition, Modernization, Creation, Tensions in French Craft, 1960 to 1990. Now, Forrest Pelsu is a design historian who's completed her master's degree at Parsons Paris, a branch of the New School, and now works between New York City and Paris. Her research focus on how craft has been collected and categorized during the 20th century aims to bring together French language and English language scholarship through archival research and translation. She's worked on exhibitions at the Museum of Arts and Design, the Brooklyn Museum, and the Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris. Uh, Forrest, welcome, and uh, you have the floor. Let's hear about your research. Hello, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Kevin, for the introduction and for the invitation to talk today. Um, and thanks in advance to Professor Wu uh, for bringing his insight to Chinese craft, which I'm uh, really eager to, to hear more about. Um, I'd like to start by noting that I'm speaking today from Brooklyn on the unceded territory of the Lenape and Canarsie peoples. And I want to respect and honor the ongoing connection of indigenous nations to this land. I'll also note that when I use the term French craft, I'm referring primarily to the practices of a French population of predominantly European heritage, um, because that was the focus of the research that I undertook for this article. So I just wanted to kind of specify that um, while there's probably a lot of different kinds of French craft that could be described with that term today, that's what, that's what I'm speaking to. So let me share my screen here. Okay, I hope everyone can see uh, the screen. Um, yes, great. So when I began working on this subject, um, it became pretty evident that a major issue would be translation. So I'll start with a brief uh, discussion about that. Um, in English, we have this really beautiful word craft, which has a broad reach. It can be a noun, a verb, an adjective. Uh, so I find that it's really dynamic and a really fluid concept. And I think that a major part of Anglophone craft studies is exploring the possibilities of this concept, not just as a material practice. And I see this kind of embodied in publications like the Journal of Modern Craft and the work of Garland Magazine. Alternatively in French, I find that the language around craft refers mainly to the level of production and so you have a network of related but distinct terms that could all be translated as craft in English, and I've listed them here. You have métier, which refers primarily to uh, workmanship and manual trades. Um, it could be sometimes synonymous with a job, uh, a métier. Artisanat uh, really is related more to the handmade and to, I would say, the more traditional aspects of the field. Um, Métier d'art and artisanat d'art, it's then, um, you know, taking these kind of first two terms and emphasizing, oops, excuse me, emphasizing the artistic uh, element of them kind of, so it's interesting already you have this tension, you know, what's the difference between artisanat and artisanat d'art. Um, and finally you have folklore, um, 
which is used to describe lifestyles and objects that are really rooted in the past. So what we might call folk art um, would be another translation for that or folk. And then one more that I actually forgot to add here, but um, which I do discuss in the article is art populaire, kind of like popular art, or again, what I would call folk art, um, which I find is also related to the idea of craft. And so taking this, uh, you know, coming into this, um, already seeing that there's such a difference. Uh, actually, I'm gonna go back a slide really quickly, excuse me. Um, already, you know, you have all these different terms and I think it's really interesting to note that they're all nouns so you don't have this same kind of flexibility that you do in English with the word craft. Um, they're all a bit more specific. They're all really kind of focused on naming, defining a practice or an object. Um, although, because there's already this kind of nebulousness in French craft and the language around French craft, I also found that it resists some of the binaries that can often uh, be established in, in English and from what I've read in Professor Wu's article in Chinese also, such as the, the binary between art and craft. Uh, I think a similar thing does exist, but, but I think it's different because, uh, for example, if you take the literal translation of arts and crafts into French, art et métier, it doesn't mean what we use it to mean in English, it actually refers to engineering. So the Ecole des Arts et Métiers, the School of Arts et Métiers, or of Arts and Crafts, as we might literally translate it, is actually a school of engineering. Um, so this is just to show that really I um, quickly understood that kind of all bets were off. Uh, my English language understanding of craft was really only going to get me so far. And it became clear that there was a really different structure at play here and a different discourse that needed to be kind of um, explored and understood before I could really get to the, the heart of, of what craft is in France. Um, taking this English understanding of craft, but then finding how it, how it is um, represented in, in France and specifically in French institutions, um, which also became a really interesting and complex issue because there's not a craft museum um, in France necessarily. There are a number of institutions that collect uh, what I would call craft objects. And this is a chart that I made kind of trying to map out, at least on the national level, there's a lot of regional institutions that I haven't had a chance to uh, go into detail on, but at least at the kind of national level, looking at how the, um, looking at how craft objects have kind of been moved around in different collections. And I think it also, again, speaks to this nebulousness um, where you have craft objects that were originally collected in an ethnographic museum, um, this collection was then split between the Musée de l'Homme, Museum of Man, and the uh, Museum of Folk Art, I would call it, Musée National des Arts et Traditions Populaires. Um, and then this collection eventually made its way, you know, objects from actually both of these collections have made their way into what are today the um, Musée, du, Musée Quai de Branly and the Musem, which is in Marseille. Um, so again, I, I won't go into too much detail with this, but it's just kind of show like, how, how fluid and how, how changing um, definitions of these craft objects have been. And I'll note that some of the definitions have kind of been based on geography. And I think there's a lot more work um, to be done to explore these kind of ethnographic collections of objects um, that are in France that could be classified as craft objects, but which do not originate um, from France. So, um, for perhaps the next article, but today I'll be speaking again about these, these uh, objects made by French makers. And so as I kind of started to try and understand the language and the, the location of, of French craft, I spoke to some colleagues about um, this, uh, some French colleagues to, to try and gain an insider perspective. And one thing that really surprised me was a lot of them um, almost all of them kind of mentioned the Second World War and were saying, oh, you know, you can't talk about craft in France today without talking about the Vichy regime. And I was really surprised by this. I didn't expect that um, this event would, would still continue to bear such an impression on, on craft and craft studies today in France. And so 
um, I turned my research to the Vichy regime, uh, which is the French government that was set up under German occupation in France during World War II. It was overseen, kind of the head, the head figure of the government was Philippe Pétain. And uh, the, it was, you know, under the kind of um, the collaborating government that collaborated with the Nazis. And so it's a very fascist kind of government. It's a very conservative kind of government. And this is an example of some propaganda from the time that I found about the Révolution Nationale, which is kind of what they named the movement um, about kind of bringing France back to itself, really nationalist movement. And here we see on the left, France as a house, um, it's kind of falling apart. It's being unsettled by things like capital and communism, radicalism, um, all these negative uh, words. And of course, we also have the, the Star of David um, and the black cloud above it. And then on the right, we have this really nicely settled, well-established, beautiful France, um, which sits at the bottom on the slogan of the French state or the Vichy regime, which is travail, famille, patrie, or work, family, country. And then there are all these other kind of elements that are supporting the foundation of France. And one of them, um, kind of the second column in, you see it says artisanat. So craft is being really directly named as part of this Révolution Nationale. And it does uh, make sense in some ways, the way that this, uh, that craft practices were being kind of folded into these ideas, these core ideas of travail, famille, patrie. So this is another um, piece of propaganda from the same time. It says, give your son the love of your craft. And so we have two um, kind of simple looking men or a man and a boy, um, you know, the boys overalls are undone. They're in pretty kind of, I'd say, kind of country attire, rural attire, might be associated also with kind of farming, you know, the overalls. Um, and then the man is working on this really beautiful piece of furniture. It's gleaming. It's got these curving legs, you know, the cabriole legs. It's, it's very, I think, could be really immediately identified as a piece of really high-end French furniture. Um, so it's kind of this, this contrast between, ah, yes, like our countryside, our, our simple people, you know, doing this work, this great work of, um, you know, beautiful French furniture. And of course, also enacting a really patriarchal system of the father giving his son the love of his trade, which kind of fits into this idea of family that the Vichy regime wanted to support, which was a very kind of, um, hierarchical and male dominated kind of idea of family. So this is just to say that uh, I did, I did, you know, it, it was really striking to me a, a very different kind of context than one that I'd seen in England um, craft and craft studies, you know, from what I knew about English history and American history, um, this completely different context for French craft where you have, this is a photo of a worker at Sev, the ceramic manufacturer painting the symbol of the French state onto a vase. And um, again, I just find that it really represents how craft at this time was being co-opted into serving uh, the French state as uh, this propaganda. And not just craft, not just this object, this vase that exists, but that there's a photograph of the person hand painting it. Again, it's just taking this the whole process of craft um, and, and putting it in the service of um, the fascist regime. And so, of course, this leaves this uh, a lasting impact even after the war is over. Um, there's kind of this what what some people describe to me as a kind of taint or like a, a mark on on French craft. Um, and in my in looking at post-war uh, craft in France, I used the work of Kristen Ross, um, who works primarily in literature. Um, was describing literature in this work that I used, but which I found also related to craft. And she proposes this idea of an internal colonization that happens after World War II, where the uh, dynamic between Thank <laughs> you. 
recording. Sorry. Um, can everyone hear me? Oh, Don't we know can what hear happened. You. You've lost the uh, share. Lost the meeting for a second. Okay, I'll, I'll share again. Um, here we go. And. Yes, so this idea of internal colonization, which I found really interesting um, and also related to uh, an archive of materials that I found that were, it was a collection of, of press clippings, of uh, magazine and newspaper clippings, um, which all use this really fatalistic language around uh, regional, rural, um, tr more traditional craft practices in France. Um, and so I found that this idea of kind of this uh, rejection of the unmodern of things that were seen as kind of of the past um, also included craft, um, especially in the wake of, like I said, this, this kind of uh, negative reputation that had been given to these traditional craft practices. And of course, um, just as artisans, you know, during World War II were not necessarily complicit in the propaganda that was created around craft, uh, there were certainly artisans who were resisting this idea of craft as unmodern at this time. Um, but I do think that regional craft was, was vulnerable to this kind of um, activity that was happening that was um, kind of pushing the, putting progress as in the cities, as in technology, as in, um, you know, kind of urban, urban lifestyles and, uh, the language that's used in, in these articles that I found really um, places craft in the past um, as something potentially to be left behind. And so here uh, is, oops, excuse me, um, just one example of these articles is this piece that was in Elle magazine in 1966. It's a tour guide um, of French craft. And so it was part of a series that focused on different regions. And Right here, um, kind of in the top corner, the little um, subtitle is a métier qui meurt, uh, a dying craft. And, and this is just one example of this kind of language that I saw used throughout these articles. Um, and I thought this was really interesting because it's kind of, at the on the one hand, valorizing and showing these crafts, and at the same time, kind of assigning them to the past and saying that they're dying. Um, but of course, at the same time, oh, this is a, I like this, a, a true, a true uh, peasant and a true sculptor. Um, so just kind of showing this, this regional identity that's being linked to some of these craft practices and, and, or the craft practices being linked to, to really a, a true, he's a true uh, peasant or farmer. Uh, and at the same time in France, you have this movement actually in the 1960s and 70s also of people who are leaving the cities who are returning to, it's called the return to nature movement. Um, they're known as neo-rural um, people and there's also neo-artisans among them. These people who are returning to the countryside who are returning to these traditional craft practices to reinvigorate them, to re-explore them um, and so it's not just a movement that's happening in one direction, there's, there's cross movements, it's happening in, in really both directions. Um, and uh, the, the, this neo-rural and neo-artisan movement, um, I would say falls within this idea of folklore and the folklorique, um, which also, I won't be able to get to it today, but the second part of my article talks about how um, this kind of sometimes comes on to take a, a pejorative connotation, um, which I also think is linked to some of what Professor Wu will be discussing in terms of how the same uh, kind of movement can have both a positive and a negative um, or uh, be seen in one light and then, and then in another. And so uh, just to kind of wrap up this, this part of my, um, this section, like I said, there's a little bit more in the article that I don't quite have time to get to, but um, I hope that you'll read it. And uh, to conclude, I want to read something. So these, this collection of newspaper clippings that I studied was actually, it had been collected by a curator, Georges-Henri Rivière, 
who was a curator at the Musée National des Arts et Traditions Populaires and actually the founder of it, so at the, the Folk Art Museum in France. And in 1947, he gave an address on the role of craft in rural reconstruction. So kind of recognizing that at this moment, France was going to be changing rapidly um, and that there was you know, rebuilding and modernizing that needed to happen. He was already speaking to how craft could be a part of that. Um, and so he says, and I've translated here from the French, he says, certainly things have evolved more in just the last century than in the millennia and a half that preceded it. But in the rural world, as conservative as it is, but the rural world, as conservative as it is, has never before truly known since its Neolithic origins, the kind of mystic immutability that we have sometimes wanted to assign it. So he's saying really that however conservative we might perceive this to be, it's not unchanging. And that in fact, the idea of what we consider traditional is an evolving and kind of living idea and process. Um, and so to speak to the title question of our talk today, uh, radical or conservative, I would say that craft, uh, from what I found um, and speaking to this time period, French craft is both. It is both of those things and it's not inherently one or the other. It's not inherently fascist, although it was used by the fascist government, um, but then it was also used um, in this return to nature movement. And so uh, you have kind of both things, both things at work. And so I end with this question mark um, in the spirit of our question of the talk. And um, yes, lots of, lots of questions I find about French craft. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Florist, for that uh, fascinating talk. And I can already see that uh, uh, Liliana's made a, a reference there to something similar in, in Portugal happening at the time. I'm not sure, Liliana, if you want to expand on that or just leave that as a point of reference. We've got a little bit of time, a few minutes, just to, to focus on Forrest's presentation uh, before we go to Professor Wu. So if you've got any questions or comments uh, that you would like or clarifications, from Forrest. Uh, I know in your article you you go on to talk about the impact of uh, craft touring from the United States in France that uh, significantly changed uh, the way people view that. Ben. Yeah, th thanks a, a bunch, Forrest, and, and I love the, the research that you've brought to, to the conversation and, and the fact you grounded it in language. And it seems that the, uh, the first part of the article, and perhaps the, the second part as well, describes a war that is waged in language. Um, and, and I was wondering whether you felt, perhaps through the clippings, but also perhaps through other ob observations, that the makers themselves had any agency in shaping the discourse around craft. Because the nature of the clippings means that it has it's happening through commentators, whether curators or or journalists uh, or policymakers. Um, do, is there the voice of crafters in there anywhere? Yeah, that's a great question and um, an important point that I think, in some ways, I I missed a bit in my research. I was really focused on this more institutional level um, and looking at. The, uh, the discourse, the way that other people were talking about craft. But I do think that looking at how, how the artisans or how the, the craftspeople or the artists as well themselves um, were speaking um, is, is, a major, is a major factor. And I think, I know that, um, for example, Georges-Henri Rivière um, at the Folk Art Museum uh, spent a lot of time doing Enquête or these kind of investigations was the style of the uh, collecting practice of that institution. And so there's huge amounts of archives of actually interviews with a lot of the people that um, were perhaps being talked about in some of these articles. Um, and so it'd be really interesting to look at some of those interviews and see, I think they were taken, undertaken in, in a bit more of like an ethnographic 
uh, way. And so kind of looking more at understanding the people. Actually, I found like a family tree in, in one of the archives of these people who owned a flour mill. Um, so really kind of looking more at, at um, kind of showing the kinds of people that, that were being uh, represented then in the collection by the objects in the collection. But I think it would be, that's it. Yeah, I think it would be really interesting to to go to return to this um, with this goal of of seeing what uh, what the makers themselves have to say, and and this might be a little more evident, and then I talk about it in, later in the article and in, in the exhibitions that were at the Musée des Arts Décoratifs, um, like this image, um, the final image that I showed, artiste artisan was one of these, and also included um, artists. So I think some of whom are are, are quite well known in France, and so. I think there's more agency perhaps in, in that example as well. Good. All right, thanks Ben for that question and then for us for elaborating. Uh, now let's move on to Professor Wu and with some luck because uh, his internet, internet connection seems a little unstable. Professor Wu, are you? Are you there? Professor Chu Wu is a professor of anthropology at East China Normal University in Shanghai. And his research is focused on sociocultural transition in the central China highlands. Uh, professor Wu. Oh, hello. Um... Sorry, my connection is not good. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank Kevin for his invitation to join this online meeting. And also thank uh, Forrest for her interesting talk. So now I, I transfer to my uh, PowerPoint. But, I think uh, you try the the bottom at button at the bottom. Can you see it? There you go. Good. Okay. Um. Yeah. My topic uh, today is about the art craft boundary in contemporary China in a case study of root carving. Uh, this article is published uh, on the journal of modern craft. Uh, I have a co-author, uh, Chang Wu. Uh, yeah, one day when when he interviewed a famous Buddhist uh, sculptor in central China, Hubei Province, he heard. Uh, that uh, artist uh, said he was not an artist. We thought uh, he was, he was an artist, but uh, himself uh, refused to uh, accept this title. So that uh, his uh, expression attracted us. So we wanted to know more about the boundary between craft and the art in our uh, contemporary social life. Uh, we found that besides China, there are also uh, other countries and societies likely to set up and keep such a boundary between craft and the art. And then uh, in the following, I would like to talk uh, more about the boundary thing in China. In China, the art craft boundary uh, existed for a long time, but with its own theoretical origins of boundary construction and the features of 
boundary crossing. And among these features, uh, we think uh, one special theory based on a special Chinese term, which is uh, Zhang Qi, uh, played uh, an important role in forming and in keeping this boundary between craft and uh, art. Oh, okay. So uh, I also checked the current uh, online dictionaries about the, the explanations, the meanings of Zhang Qi. Now I got a very interesting answer. Uh, one dictionary says, uh, literally, Zhang Xu means crafts, craftsman's heir. Uh, but this is uh, a regulatory term applied by people to evaluate the sensory effects of a human product, which is negative. Rigidity means rigidity. Uh, and another uh, explanation is given by this dictionary sounds very interesting. It says this term doesn't uh, uh, derogate craftsman in itself. So uh, this sentence, this expression, uh, we wanted to, uh, to talk more in the following. Uh, also, in the master's course in contemporary Chinese society, uh, Jiang Qi has been applied to express more meanings. For example, Jiang Qi refers to a uh, racial impression, and the Jiang Qi is mainly associated with uh, handicraft uh, because uh, a craft implies something that can be copied. Uh, then Chi is also related to our work with a lot of elaboration, uh, namely pursuit of perfection. So if you, sorry for the connection. Uh, okay. The term Zhang, craft, in the theoretical construction of Chinese art critiques, uh, in times of the pre-Qin dynasty, uh, Qin dynasty was set up since 1644. So in the times of pre-1644, uh, we found certain terms uh, with Zhang, um, had a positive meanings, for example, craft your heart, Jiang Xin craft your heart. Another one is a uh, craft will, Jiang uh, Yi. Uh, both uh, implies positive meanings. Uh, and uh, another interesting phenomenon is in the pre Qin dynasties, like in the Ming dynasties. Uh, which lasted from 1368 to 1644. Uh, during that uh, time period, crafts uh, sometimes were considered the top artists. Uh, for example, there's one called the Chu Yin. Uh, he was a famous artist living uh, in the Ming Dynasty but uh, he made a living by painting a house for others too. Uh, uh, another one is Dai Jing, uh, a famous artist in Ming Dynasty. He was actually a gold and a silver smith. So um, what's your uh, uh, profession and being a, a one's profession and once being an artist that doesn't uh, there, uh, there's no clear uh, boundary there in, uh, in the Ming Dynasty. Um, but the thing seems changing uh, in since the Qin Dynasty, 
Qin Dynasty last video from 1644 to 1911. Uh, since the construction by Qin scholars and the art critics, Jiangqi uh, means crowds air or journeymanness or craftsmanness. Uh, gradually had been led to uh, legacy limits, um, crafts rigidity, uh, vulgarity, vulgarity uh, implies that one's work, one's product uh, are short of flexibility, vividness, and spirituality. Uh, one important figure in pushing the meaning of Jiangxi to the uh, negative track might be uh, a famous philosopher in the Chinese history. Uh, his name is, was Wang Fuzhi, and uh, he once said, uh, people full of Jiangxi were those who were able to depict the scenes, paint, colors, highlight, metaphors, and the poetry and image, we would need to the extreme uh, pursuit of perfection. Uh, another famous scholar, uh, Zhou Yigui, uh, included the Jiangxi, one of the six bad practice in painting, and uh, describing how it results in the work uh, he worked with uh, for, uh, quality, but with limited uh, lasting appeal. Uh, one interesting thing is uh, he also make a, made a comment about the Western painting at that time. I think Western painting was full of craft rigidity. So, I think you can make your own judgment to, uh, to, to see if those uh, arguments was right or wrong. Uh, one more Qin uh, scholar, uh, art critic, uh, Shen Fu, uh, once complained about the Jiangxi in bonsai, uh, people playing with the, with the plants to say the the proper training of a tree, however, takes at least 30 to 40 years. Trees whose branches are trained in different horizontal circles going up like a pangoda or whose branches turn round and round like earthworms are incurably vulgar. Uh, vulgar is original uh, Chinese is Jiangxi. Okay, uh, so our questions have this term Jiangxi uh, derogate, derogate a craftsman in itself. The dictionary says no, but we think a little bit different. Uh, in Chinese uh, aesthetic history, the concept of Jiangxi has also helped to by literary painting as art and almost all carving, weaving, and so on as crafts. And also in the past, most of the Chinese craftsmen were literate and their work considered as belonging to the bottom of the art hierarchy. Uh, so we get a conclusion here that uh, for the developing of this terminology, Jiangxi and craftsmen become uh, kind of victims. Uh, so craftsmen was put at the bottom of this uh, art hierarchy. And uh, I, I got some explanations uh, online. And uh, they say there are certain reasons why Crossman had to be at the bottom. The uh, real reasons include their uh, lack of intellectual, cultural uh, capitals. Uh, generally, 
craftsmen equals to illiterate, well, worldly people, uh, lack of rationality. Uh, and also for their profession in their various uh, craft activities, they have a certain uh, skill training activities, which uh, depend on oral instruction and observation, and they heavily depend on their, their masters. So they form a certain uh, special relationship uh, symbolized by their special master of uh, apprentice ethical code plus certain beliefs. Uh, for example, they have owned uh, a lot of taboos in their work. Uh, and also, I uh, got one information from online sources. Let's say uh, another term, Gong Jiang Jing Shi, means craftsman spirit, which is currently applied as a positive meaning. However, these pieces of information online I, I, I got uh, said uh, craftsman spirit. Uh, means pursuit of perfection. Um, however, this is a pseudo conception. Uh, so this author suspect uh, the positivity of this terminology. Uh, his argument including uh, not all craftsmen pursued perfection. And they also many other professions also pursuit perfection. So this is the first time I see people think another positive uh, term related to the uh, craft. It also speak to, speaks to uh, negative meanings. Okay, then in our research, uh, we also uh, concerned with the the boundary, the crossing of the boundary, how to uh, cross the boundary from craft to art. Because in China, generally, we, we didn't know if there are any uh, artists that wanted to cross the boundary and they claim to be a craftsman. So this is rarely heard about. Uh, so we mainly focus on how to cross from craft side to art side. Uh, generally speaking, there are three key factors. If you, if one wants to cross the boundary from craft to art, uh, first of all, you need to increase your intellectual or cultural capitals. Uh, secondly, pay less heed to craft rigidity, jiangxi, or be steady. So don't try to pursue the, uh, the perfection uh, to the extreme. Uh, then finally, you needed to develop relationships with well-known public figures. So all these three strategies had been successfully applied by one Chinese uh, famous artist, Qi Bai Shi, uh, during the Republic era in the Chinese history. So, his life uh, history uh, was a uh, crossing process from carpenter to artist. So uh, during our uh, field work, we interviewed a, a locally famous Lotus carpenter uh, in Lichuan City, Hubei province in central China. So he was, uh, offered, uh, awarded a title of the country's uh, uh, heritage in character uh, at the county level in 2010 and the provincial level here, uh, in character uh, in 2018. So uh, in, in his work, and there are a lot of creativity you can uh, uh, easily observe, as I show in these photos. Uh, because 
uh, being an uh, inheritor of cultural heritage, he got more opportunities than other um, uh, fellow, uh, fellow uh, sculptors. For example, he get more opportunities to get a training workshops taught by famous artists. And uh, uh, he learned a lot of new, uh, more uh, new theories and new techniques and skills. And they also uh, heritage protection projects help him to know more famous public figures. So basically speaking, uh, this one, this sculptor uh, got a lot of uh, resources for him to cross from cross the boundary from uh, the craft to art. But uh, as we know, he refused to think he was an uh, artist, uh, at least uh, so far. Uh, so uh, after our uh, letter says, we thought a heritage pro pro projects a perfect folk handicraft into two directions at the same time. One move to the innovation, another one hold them to the rigidity, or to the craft rigidity. So uh, on the one direction, uh, these projects help them to increase their diversity and the technique innovation, and also they re because this kind of project focus on heritage. So you must keep your indigenous, uh, indigenousness. So that way you have to pay much attention to how to keep something unchanging. So uh, the rigidity become uh, uh, one of the required. Uh, one more impact came from the market uh, and also indirectly uh, this impacts also from the uh, heritage protection uh, projects because uh, uh, of the markets, because they needed to supply a lot of uh, craft uh, 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 products to the local tourism, tourist market for uh, those tourists. So tourists want those uh, products uh, uh, which to be identifiable with the traditional or the folk objects. So they have uh, how to keep certain features unchanging. Then uh, simply put it, heritage movement plus market push uh, the craftsman uh, crossing of the boundary uh, between craft and art, uh, even more difficult. So that's one of our understanding of the of the of this boundary. Uh, finally, uh, we we uh, we think uh, this sculptor's career as a folk craftsman and his uh, products has been shaped by a number of factors, including China's traditional art philosophy, social movements like heritage protection, shifts in the market, individual agency, and the attributes of raw materials he has used for carving because the root, each root has its own uh, features and the shapes they have to uh, keep these features in their, in their uh, work. So uh, the art craft boundary, at least in China, cannot be clearly crossed, but it can certainly be effectively managed. And that's uh, our uh, final conclusion. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I, I, I can stop here. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Wu, and to also um, Chang Wu, I think is here as well. And yeah, yeah, I, I, I noted him. <laughs> yes, and uh, yes, we've got, uh, are you going to say hello, uh, Professor Hi. Chang? Hi, 
Hello. Anyhow, good. Uh, it's a shame we can't see either of you, but uh, you might want to try to put your camera on, uh, see how it goes. <clears throat> but uh, meanwhile, we've got so much to, to look at here and so little time. Uh, I can see Professor Wu. Good, Hello. good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Professor Chang as well. Greetings, good to see you both. Uh, yes. I wonder if, uh, uh, firstly, Professor Chen, uh, if you had any comment or questions as somebody who has given us an interesting perspective on crafting contemporary China. Is there anything you would like to, to add or to, to ask? Helen. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, as, as, uh, as regards to my experience in the ICH safeguarding in China now, I think it basically it will uh, encourage the innovation and uh, as well as the markets. Uh, so that's maybe some different views uh, between uh, me and Professor Wu. Professor Wu, Hello. <laughs> my first time to meet you. Yeah. yeah nice to meet you. Yeah. 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 And uh, as it regards to the conception you referred uh, in your discussion, the Jiang uh, Qi, uh, yes, I agree with you, but I will add one another uh, conception uh, pattern, uh, which in Chinese may be. Uh, or Fu. Uh, this is uh, a characteristic of <laughs> literati. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh. So, so, <laughs> so is uh, I, I just added. I think he's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, that yeah. one we 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 forgot. Yeah, because, <laughs> yeah, because in the Asian China, the uh, the diff, uh, the separation between the artist and the craftsman is uh, is made by uh, some kind of literati, the upper class, mm -hmm. and the, the the intellectuals who is educated, and but some of them will not be successful. So that is panache. <laughs> mm -hmm. They, they yeah. can do also panache, uh, even in his uh, artistic creation. Mm -hmm. So so that is another. A way <laughs> to value the uh, the artworks. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Well, we didn't think about the another side. We just focus on the craft yeah. side. <laughs> yes. So yes. yeah, they also have a sort of negative meanings with the another side. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I I also want to say before uh, the literary arts. Uh, formed, uh, I mean, uh, before preaching, uh, 2000 years ago in the preaching, uh, the, uh, for example, in Zhuangzi, uh, the craftsman and his, his skill is always in a positive sense. Hmm. Uh, only when, only when the literary class, they uh, learn how to do some uh, crafts and do some calligraphies, paintings, and then uh, they will have some difference between the artist and the craftsman. But before that, uh, a man who can do something, make something, uh, is, uh, is some kind of uh, advantage. Mm, that's very interesting. Okay. I wonder in the <laughs> short time, you know? Forrest, oh. or somebody, sorry, mm. Professor Wu, did you have something to say? So I just wonder when in the Chinese history, uh, what a dynasty uh, people began to to rank and uh, rank the craftsmen at the bottom of the hierarchy. So I wonder, mm -hmm. Professor Chen, do you know that? Uh, is a uh, is in the East 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 Han Dynasty since East Han. Oh, oh yeah. okay. In the Wei Jin, okay. Wei Jin. Mm. And oh, the literary oh. class, they learn to how to paint and how to do some. 
Oh, okay. So that is are... the meaning of, of the <laughs> difference between uh, artists and the craftsmen, I think. Mm. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. So okay. In, the, in the brief time that we have, we can try and connect the two papers, Forrest, uh, from what you've heard and read uh, of the article by these professors. Uh, what do you think are interesting similarities and differences? Is there a, a parallel in the focus on intangible heritage in China with the way craft is represented? Uh, certainly is something uh, backward in the in in the countryside in France. H how do you view what you've heard? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one, just the, the focus on language and how these terms are used and the connotations that they have um, in the different cultures. I think um, even though they're completely different languages, I see there's a lot of similarities in, in that study. Um, and yes, absolutely. The, the kind of parallels between um, how craft is being used um, either for to kind of affirm this identity of, of being kind of traditional and regional or whether it's sometimes trying to resist that identity of, of being kind of placed um, as this traditional practice. Um, I was I was really interested to learn actually about well as as um, Shu Wu says as the opening this statement I'm not an artist you know this kind of idea of um, really kind of defining oneself as a craftsperson in order to access this certain part of the culture um, this yeah protected. Uh, intangible practice, but also just kind of these connotations they, they talk to in the in their paper about this idea of created indigenousness, which I thought was really fascinating. Um, the way that even if a tradition doesn't already exist, it can be kind of retroactively created as a tradition, which I thought was really fascinating, um, especially in, in the context and in France of kind of this neo-artisan movement of these people who were kind of returning to the countryside and, and reinvigorating these traditional craft practices, which may or may not have always been directly related to the region they were in or directly part of a history, maybe inspired by kind of this idea of a past um, that didn't necessarily exist. And so I, I was really interested to learn about this, uh, yes, indigenous, the idea of the indigenousness of um, the root carving example, that's the case study. Um, so. Yeah, thank you, Forrest. I, I have a question. Uh, I wonder in France, uh, has craft uh, been ranked with other professions together? Has it been ranked? Like a put them in, with, in, yeah, in like yeah. hierarchy? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would say so. I would say that it's, it's, I mean, again, because of this, there's so many different parts of it, um, but there's certainly a certain um, echelon of French craft that's also really protected in France, um, thinking of there are these workshops for weaving and for furniture making. Um, I would say kind of, it's a little bit more on maybe like the kind of luxury side of craft that's being really protected, um, but, with the kind of folk art um, or kind of more regional craft practices. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question to see how it's been, um, yeah, how, how it's considered professionally. I, I haven't really looked into that as much. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Does anyone else have anything to add to this conversation? Uh, okay, so we're, we're, we're coming to an end uh, to see that there is a lot more to say about this and uh, certainly in the case of uh, the richness of Chinese history, uh, we see that uh, there is this duality in craft between its uh, skill, 
facility, we might call it, and formality, uh, which is the, uh, the, the virtuosic side of it. And clearly a culture that is informed so much by Taoism, thinking back to the writings of uh, Zhuangzi uh, in the 4th century BC, uh, who championed the craft uh, for uh, its capacity to be flexible, uh, to, to understand the, the way of qi, uh, that there are different perspectives in the case of uh, craft that Forrest understood as well. So as with many discussions, it's something which opens our eyes to the complexity. And this dialogue between France and China, I think has been uh, wonderful. And craft is an important platform for this kind of international dialogue. And so I hope it can continue and we can pick the threads of this for future discussions. So I'd like to say uh, merci and uh, she she. Uh, to uh, <laughs> Professor Wu and uh, Ms. Forrest Pelsu for a, uh, a wonderful set of presentations and we look forward to your future writing. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kevin, for hosting stay, today. Stay tuned, everyone, for future fascinating conversations when the world comes together to talk craft. Hey, thank you, Kevin. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.